Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Ben Merkel's talk, Godlust, from our audio collection titled The Grace Agenda. If you're enjoying this podcast, I want to ask you that you leave a rating and a review wherever you get your podcasts. These ratings and reviews help us get out this free content to bless more and more people. Thanks. Our next speaker is Ben Merkel. He's a fellow of theology and classical language at NSA, uh, as well as an instructor at Grey Fires Hall. He's the author of The White Horse King, put out by Thomas Nelson, and he's an elder at Christ Church. He's been a, a rodeo clown in Lewiston for a number of years, and Ben received his BS in secondary education in chemistry and his MA in English Lit at the University of Idaho. He's also been awarded an MST in Jewish Studies from Oxford, and he's just about to finish his dissertation uh, in Oriental Studies from the University of Oxford also. And he and his wife, Becca, have five kiddos. Let's welcome Ben. Thank you, Mitch. A while ago, I wrote a um, a bio for Mitch, I think, for a credenda something, and I included his his habit of um, being into modern dance and um, recumbent bicycling. So, <laughs> what comes around goes around, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to be speaking uh, this afternoon on um, God's will, uh, our desire, and the life of prayer. So let's pray and ask God to bless our time. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We praise you. Uh, we know that you're the, the God of all mercy and all grace that we receive. We thank you and praise you for this. Lord, we know you've also commanded us to ask that uh, your will be done, your, your kingdom come, and your will to be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, I pray that as we, as we come to this subject uh, this afternoon, that you would teach us to understand that more and more and to apply it more and more to our lives. We praise things in your son's name. Amen. Um, one of the one of the other um, sort of part-time jobs, I think a lot of the people in Moscow always have about six or seven uh, little jobs that all stack up into one big uh, job. And one of the other things that I do is I coach the lacrosse team at uh, Logos High School, our, logo, our local Christian school. I've been coaching the varsity boys there for a number of years there. I enjoy it quite a lot because there's, I, I enjoy this sport. It's a fun sport. But um, one of the great things about coaching boys is you get this opportunity, it opens up all sorts of opportunities to apply really important biblical truths at this point where um, it just becomes so incredibly tangible. Um, there's, there's nothing like talking about diligence and perseverance um, at that moment when the kid is just thrown up and it's time to get back on the line and, and keep at it. Um, and I, I really enjoy being able to be there with the guys to teach them about um, dealing with laziness, dealing with um, you know, knowing what it means to be brave, to not uh, be a, a slave to cowardice as you get out there to, to face opponents that are a lot bigger than you. There's all sorts of little applications, you know, important things that, that a young man has to grow up, has to learn to grow up and to be a godly Christian man that you get to see lived out um, in, in those kinds of situations. And it's, um, it's quite a lot of fun. One of the things that I've noticed that's um, it's confused me for a while, it take me a while to sort, sort of figure out, is there's this, um, there's this strange way in which uh, players, uh, high school boys, will choke at critical moments. Um, and, and choking in a in competitive thing, you know, that's not hard to understand. Uh, you miss the pass or you know, your, your nerves are, are um, sort of get the better of you and so you end up fumbling at the moment when everybody needed you to not. That's easy enough to understand. But what I'm talking about is there's a tendency for um, a player and it's not, the, it's not the guy who's the bench warmer, it's the guy who's actually the clear star of the team, the guy who everybody relies on. He's the one that if we're in that clutch moment and we've got to score that goal in, in overtime, we're gonna get him the ball. It's, it's that player right there. And it's right before a, a game that is gonna be really, really important. You see them start to look for excuses to not play. Um, and, and it's just, it's strange little things. They'll have a, you know, a, a sprain that's like, you know, how do you, how do you really know for sure whether he sprained it that bad? But they're limp and they say, sorry, coach, I just can't do it. Um, and they start coming up with just strange, strange excuses for why they can't be there at that moment you need the most. Orthodontist appointment. I know it's the championship. 
but you know this orthodox point I got to make it and and you you could you would expect it from your guys who are you younger guys, and this is always a senior, you know, you expect it from your younger guys, you expect it from your inexperienced guys, you expect it from your guys who are not necessarily the stars of the team, but the guy who everybody is depending on them and they've got so much experience behind them, why are they suddenly sort of cringing and looking for opportunities to back out? They've always been there for you before and then suddenly at this moment they want to pull out. But as you think about it, it's, it starts to make a lot of sense. Um, they don't want to go on the field because they are the one that would make the difference, but they might not, right? They're the, they're the one that everybody is depending on and they might fail. Um, it's easier and more face saving to say, um, man, bummer the team lost that game because I couldn't be with them. Drat that orthodontist appointment. You know, sorry guys. It's easier to say that than the team lost because I was there and couldn't deliver. You know, the star was on the field and the team just plain wasn't as good as we thought we were. Um, and, and we look for, and so you see the players kind of looking for excuses to not be in that moment where everything's going to be riding on it and then end up failing. It's a, it's a very, very hard thing, right? It's a very hard thing to put everything into a particular desire. You know, want something really, really badly. We desperately want to win this game. Put everything in it and then and try for it and then fail and have it taken from you to not get what you're trying for. It's devastating. And so we protect ourselves from it by not letting ourselves get into that moment where we could be, um, we could be devastated like that. I mean, and you see this, again, sports is a great uh, illustration of this. You know, you go to watch any, you know, NCAA Division I championship game and right, right at that final buzzer, they, you zoom in, the camera always zoom in on the star of that losing team, right? The camera losing, it will zoom in on him and he will be on the basketball court on the side of the field just bawling, just falling apart because he tried, put everything into it and didn't get it. And it's, it's, a, it's a devastating thing. And we all, we all know what that's like. We do that in other parts of our life. These, and these are, of course, these are the guys that actually had a chance that could make it there. Most of us never even get to the point where we could, um, where, where it might have been within our reach. But we do this sort of thing all the time, right? With our desires, with the things that we most want, with the things that we desperately want, we will, um, w w when it's taken from us, when, it's, um, when we don't get that thing, we find, we look for ways to sort of back ourselves off, to downplay our desire. Okay, I, I want that job so badly, I want that job so badly, I apply, I don't get the job. And what's the first thing you do when you walk out from hearing that you didn't get the job? Didn't want it. <laughs> I was just, you know, I didn't really want it. It wasn't, it's pretty much, it was a lame job. I was just, you know, looking for other opportunities. I like to keep my opportunities open, see what, see what might uh, come up. Guy, a guy asks a girl out that he's had a thing for forever and she shoots him down and immediately afterwards, you know, I didn't really care. I was just being nice to her. I felt bad for her. <laughs> I, it's not a big deal for me at all. And we, we know how to do that. Just in, we do it in, um, instinctively. Something you want desperately is taken from you and the first thing you do is you try to position yourself as wasn't that important to me. I, d I didn't really want it. And the reason why is because that idea of having your, all your hopes, all your dreams, all your desires in something and then have that thing taken away, it's just, it's too devastating. It hurts too much. And so we pull back. We pull ourselves back. We pull our wants back. We downscale what our desires are, what our dreams are. We, we, we um, tone it all way, way down because we don't want to risk that. We don't want to be um, left empty handed in something like that. And then think for a moment then what this must do to our prayer life. Think for a moment. If, if you do that, if you're somebody who's constantly pulling your wants back and scaling down what your desires are and you have a hard time admitting to yourself those things that you really want and you have a hard time really putting your heart into something, what does that do to your prayer life? How do, how do you pray if you're crippled like that? And if you think about it in, in a certain sense, praying is just wanting in front of God, right? When you pray, what do you do? You just think about the things that you want and then at the end you say, amen, in Jesus' name, amen. Prayer is just wanting in front of God, in Jesus' name, amen. That's what we do when we pray, but if we don't know how to express our wants, if we can't be honest about the things we want, and if we can't really pour ourselves into our wants, well, what do we do when we pray then? 
Are we, when we come before God and we want in front of Him, are we actually telling Him the things that we want or are we playing the same, ga same games with God that we would pray, play with our friend next to us after we came out from getting shot down at that job interview? Didn't really want it. Okay. Are we really able to tell God about the things uh, that we want? Um, how often do we pray for something or, or do we not pray for something because we know that that thing is so out of our reach um, that it's, it's not even worth praying for? How, many, how often do you think about something you desperately want but it's such an unrealistic request that you are ashamed to even put it into words before the Father? You don't really even want to tell the Father about it because it's such an unreasonable request and yet it's still the thing that you really, really want. Um, how often do we scale down our prayer requests because, um, because you do want it so badly and to pray for it and really put your heart into it and then have it not happen, to have the answer be no would be too devastating. So you're not going to bring it in prayer. Even though it's not before anybody else, it's just before the Father to have committed yourself to that desire, it still would be too devastating to then hear a no from it. But the problem is regardless of whether we bring these things to the Father or not, these are still things that we want, right? There's still things that we, in our heart, we still have that desire and yet we're not able to come to the Father with them because we're scared of our own wants. And then what ends up happening is these desires that need to be brought to the Father end up, um, we, we pull them back, we scale them down, and then we satiate them, we satisfy them with s silly little private fantasies. Okay. Silly little private fantasies. Uh, I think um, Mark Driscoll was talking about this uh, last night when he was describing these guys in their World of Warcraft alternative lives. Right? That, what is that other than um, somebody who said, here's what I would love to be. I would love to be this epic hero who goes on missions and, um, and frees people and takes back women. And I, I would love to be that kind of person, yet I have no chance of being that. And so I'll find an alternative little way to satisfy that desire. And we come up with our own little private fantasies to live out and satiate our desires rather than taking our desires to the Father and looking for Him to actually grant them in our real life. And then these private desires, they turn pornographic. Nate was talking about in his last talk. It can turn pornographic as you look for, I mean, in, in a sense, that's what pornography is, is the um, desire to have images hop to and obey at the click of a mouse, okay? Real world doesn't work like that. Real women don't work like that. But here's a way to live out those fantasies, to have those desires satisfied um, outside of the real world, satisfied in a very um, not so real sense. We do this with um, uh, imaginary wealth. Yeah, I could, I could find myself doing this with a, you know, there, there's, the, there's the visa bill that you're trying to figure out, how, are, how am I even going to pay this visa bill? And then you end up, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to figure out how you're going to pay that and so you sort of um, um, go within yourself and start doing this private fantasy of, well, but what if I had a $30 million lottery ticket? How would I then spend that? And then you can sit and you can go and you can think of all that, you know, I would tithe, I would finance lots of uh, missions, I'd be a very godly person. And you, and you could go and you explain all the different things you would do with your fantasy money and when actually you, you can't even pay your visa bill. Um, but because uh, things are not going well for you in this life, you kind of have this alternative reality that you start, that you, you go to and you, and you live that out and you find some satisfaction there. Um, I, I notice one of the things, uh, it's funny when you watch like um, uh, sitcoms or various TV shows, one of the scenes you see regularly, I mean, it's almost every episode, uh, there's, there's some sort of interaction where there's a really obnoxious, tyrannical person who comes in and tries to be obnoxious and tyrannical. And then there's a very quick-witted, smooth person who just utterly humbles them and shames them with just some quick back and forth, some, some witty back and forth, and the, that person is just humiliated. Okay. Why is that in every, every TV show? Because that's a little daydream that we love to fantasize about. That's something that's playing in our minds again and again because things at work, things at school, friendships, marriages are not going so well and so we like to kind of go inside of ourselves and just have these imaginary encounters where we are this guy who's just really quick uh, with the one-liners. But um, so because living the life that, we some, that we're wanting can feel so hopeless, then we resort to this um, world of fantasy. Fantasy seems to be our only way of release. And 
Now that's, that's what I'm describing wants and desires that we're perhaps not sure if we, we could ever actually get in this life. Um, and that can push us to the world of fantasy. But there's also, um, there's also desires that we have that are just flat out wicked. We don't bring them to the Father because it's just a sin that I'm asking for. Right, just flat out wicked desires. Uh, Nate was talking about this, things that we just want to sin. We, we desire to sin. And these are desires that you can't want that want in front of God. You can't convert that want in a prayer because you'd be standing before the Holy Father um, asking for something dirty, asking for something wicked. And so we, our desires then are crippled because there are wants that we can't take to him because we're too scared. And then there are desires we can't take to him because we're too ashamed. Um, Paul describes that in Romans 7. Uh, Doug referred to this um, last night when he was talking about there's some debate about, you know, is Romans 7 talking about a Christian or a non-Christian? Um, Paul says, I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. It's that split desire that Paul is describing. And, and in one sense, people want to say, no, that's not what a Christian is. A Christian wouldn't be all um, convoluted like that. But then I want to say, really? I mean, do you not have moments where you're wanting the thing that you don't want to want? Do you not have moments where you're consumed by a desire and at the same time really um, desperately wanting that desire gone? And you've got two wants that are wrestling back and forth. And as, as Doug pointed out, Galatians 5, we only need to go to Galatians 5 to point out that, yeah, this is what a Christian is like. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. You don't do the things that you wish. That is, that is the situation we're in where our desires are oftentimes wicked. And because our desires are wicked, we can't take them to the Father. We can't convert them into prayers and ask for him to satisfy them. And sometimes um, I've, I've seen people do this where they try to kind of up the ante of sin. You know, you try to make sin, um, you, you sort of figure out how to distill sin and look at it in its most gruesome and ugly, um, you know, reality or manifestation. And then hopefully that will make you not want it anymore. I remember hearing somebody say, you know, what I do is I think about how, okay, whenever I sin, what I'm doing is I'm putting another nail into Jesus or I'm crucifying Jesus all over again. And then, and then I can really see how bad my sin is. Well, first of all, it's, it's garbage. It's bogus. Christ died once for all. We don't re-crucify with each um, Christ with each sin. He died once for all. And second of all, that's um, it's not a very potent strategy, because what you're assuming is the reason why you sin is because lack of clarity. It's not lack of clarity that makes us sin. We don't we don't sin because for that brief moment I just kind of forgot. Um, that this is a bad thing to do and that this is something that Jesus doesn't want me to do. That, that's not why we sin. We sin because our desires are wicked and we can be we're drawn by wicked desires. It's not a lack of clarity, but a weakness of will that we fall to. And so because of this then, we find ourselves um, scared of our desires because either our desires seem so unattainable that to, to pursue them for real seems futile um, you know, it's something that what I would never actually become what I want, or our desires are so obviously wicked. And because of this, these desires don't get brought to God as prayers, um, but they end up squirted out the side as sinful lust, private fantasy, or unexpressed longing. Okay? Instead of bringing them to the Father in prayer, they get squirted out the side and become these weird substitutes for prayer that get us nowhere. And it's tragic that we struggle so much with our desires because that we find ourselves so tripped up by our own wanting because scripture promises throughout that we need to only make our desires known to God and he will answer them. It's, it's tragic that we are so lost with our desires when we have a God who is constantly promising to satisfy our every desire. Uh, it's, it's sad that we're, we're so, our, our desires are so poisoned and so weak when we have a God who wants to fix it all. Look at Luke uh, chapter 11, verses 5 through 10. And this is immediately after uh, the Lord's Prayer. So this is in the context of Jesus teaching his disciples how to pray. And 
And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me on his journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within and say, Do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will op be opened. And think about that. This is how Jesus is teaching us to pray, and what a great story um, to illustrate that. When you, um, th do you realize what he's urging his disciples to do? Okay? He, he's describing somebody who is becoming obnoxiously persistent. Okay, this guy is in bed. He's settled in bed. He's wanting to go to sleep, and the neighbor knocks on the door and says, "I, you know, I need some bread for my friend." And and Jesus says, "Now he might not get out of bed for for love or for generosity, but he would get out if you're just persistent. If you just annoy the heck out of him, so there's nothing he can do but give it to you to make you go away, so he can finally get some sleep. He wants you to be persistent and obnoxious and regularly at it, coming to him again and again, saying." Please give this to me. And then he follows it with this promise that if you ask, he's going to give it to you. God is the father who wants to give to his children. And that's the next little bit where he describes how, um, uh, you know, would a son not give a good gift to his father? If you're his children, is he not going to give good gifts to you? So here we are with our desires, not able to bring them to the father. But Jesus is telling us, look, he wants you to come to him and he wants you to be persistent. And he wants you to ask again and again. And he wants you to do that so he can give you what he desires. And I think of that, <coughs> excuse me, if this is an illustration of what the Heavenly Father is like. What a great picture this is for earthly fathers to be thinking about with our own children. All right, the kid is down there tugging at your pant leg saying, Dad, can I have? And, and I want to say, man, you know, you're scuffing my shoes. You need to get away and just give me some space. God's not like that. God is saying, I want you to do that some more. I want you to do that again. And I want you to do it so that I can answer your prayer, so that I can give you what you have asked for. Psalm 145, verse 19. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. And that's such an important verse. He will fulfill the desires of those who fear him. That ought to change the way we pray. God wants to fulfill your desires. He wants to answer your requests. And, and, um, and this is the thing. We often will say, well, um, yeah, God promises to answer all prayers. It's just that sometimes, when we read most of the time, the answer is no. Okay? He always answers your prayer. It's just that you know, the answer could be yes, could be no. That's not what this verse says. It says he wants to fulfill your desires. The thing you want for, you want, he wants to give to you. We are so quick when we hear these kinds of passages to get scared that this is going to turn into a name it and claim it kind of theology. We're so quick to hear that and, the, and we, we read the verse and the first thing that comes to our mind is all the ways that this verse doesn't apply and all the things that these passages do not mean. We, we, go, we, we read that verse and we run straight to the sort of theological footnote that contextualizes it and makes it okay to read and makes it orthodox. And we don't take the time to actually read and hear and understand and believe what the text is saying. God wants to give you what you want. God wants to fulfill your desires. God wants his children wanting things and him giving them to him. That's what a father does for a son. Right? That's what a, a, father, a healthy father-son relationship is a father giving things, passing them on to his son. The father wants to fulfill your desires. Don't castrate the promise. Don't rob it of all of its potency. Don't turn it into something. Well, don't skip entirely what it is saying. Let your theology be shaped by Scripture. Don't let your theology dictate what Scripture can and cannot say. God intends for us to live in a state where we bring our requests to Him and He answers them with a yes. And that's the big thing. He wants to be able to answer our requests with a yes. Now, I know, I know that you can, in these passages, there are important things to add. There are important things to say and qualify and contextualize. I understand that and we'll do that in a little bit. But don't let that important duty rob you of realizing what it says. This bit, this initial problem where we're sitting here wanting and wanting and wanting and not coming to the Father in prayer, that's not how it's supposed to be. God wants us praying to Him and He wants to be answering our prayers. Um, 
He wants to heal your divided self so that you're not wanting what you don't want. He wants you to not shrink back from bringing your request to him because you're scared of a no. God intends for you to live in that position where you're asking and he's giving, where you're a child and he is your father. Psalm 86, 11, uh, David prays, unite my heart to fear your name. Unite my heart to fear your name. David understands that pull of the divided heart and he prays and he says, God, put me all together. Unite my heart so that I'm not divided. I'm not Roman seven in, in my heart. Um, I want to be united to follow after you. We want to be like uh, the, the great patriarch Caleb. Um, Caleb, Joshua 14, 14, we're told that he followed wholly after the Lord. He followed wholly after the Lord. And his name Caleb in the Hebrew, it's just kol lev, wholehearted. He's, he's a man with his heart entirely united. And you can see, just read the story of Caleb. That's how he lived. He knew what he wanted. And he would walk forward and say, here's what I want. And God would say, yes, I want to give that to you. Right? That's how he wants his children uh, to be living. God wants his people to be a people with hearts and desires united, not conflicted, united with ourselves, united with the will of the sovereign God who rules all such that he is granting all of our requests. It is, and um, think of it, look in John, John 14, verses 13 through 14. Listen to this carefully. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Okay? Again, let it that go home. Knock off the qualifying. Don't contextualize it. Just hear what he is actually promising. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do. You ask it, and I will give it to you. Um, if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. This is Jesus' promise to you. And, and not only that, there's this promise that he's going to give you what you ask for, but he says um, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Right? He's going to give it to you because it is the glory of the Father to give, to answer, to answer positively our requests. He wants to give you what you want so that the Father will be glorified. Again in John 15, he says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. Okay? It, it's not just that God wants you to come to him and ask for things and he wants to give these things to you, but this is his preferred method. This is one of his favorite ways of manifesting his glory to the world. When the saints are wanting before the Father and he's granting their requests, Everybody looks at that and they see what a great God they must worship. But we are scared when we make our requests. Uh, we feel like we're maybe being too much of a pain. Uh, we, we feel like we're the kids scuffing dad's boots. We're scared we're gonna exhaust God's resources or we're gonna exhaust God's patience. When Jesus told us, be obnoxious, be annoying, pester him. It says here that he's glorified by us asking things from him and granting uh, those requests, whatever we ask. If you ask anything, ask what you desire. So you see then what a tragedy it is when we won't bring our desires to God in prayer and prefer to have them satisfied with petty fantasies rather than have the Father glorified by answering our requests and by giving us what we have asked for. So what then is our problem? What is our holdup? James chapter one, James talks about this. <clears throat> rather, James chapter 4. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Okay? Your desires, they're warring inside of you. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. There's two problems that James names here, okay? First, that we don't ask, and then that we ask amiss. The first problem, let's look at that. He says that our problems, our, our dissatisfaction, our unfulfilled lusting um, comes from, first of all, this inability to come before the Father and make our requests known to Him. We won't come and ask God for what we want. Here we are with God promising to give us what we want. We are still tangled up with ourselves because we won't take our desires to God. We sit and we lust privately because we're either too scared to ask, for, um, ask from God because of a fear that he will say no or because we are ashamed to ask from God because we know that what we want is wicked. 
And James says that your life is screwed up because you won't just sit down and pray about what you want. Paul tells Timothy, 1 Timothy 2, 8, I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Okay? Um, Paul says you're supposed to pray without wrath and without doubting. All right? Pray without doubting. You're supposed to, when you pray, you're not supposed to come before him wondering, maybe hedging your bets, you know, um, sort of downgrading your promises because you don't think it could really happen. He wants you to pray with confidence. He wants you to really ask God for what you really want. Pray with confidence. But it's weird here, if you think about it, that he, he pairs off um, without doubting um, with wrath, without wrath, okay? I want you to pray without wrath and without doubting. Okay. Doubting and wrath go together. When you are a doubter in God's provision for you, it turns you into a very angry person. And that's James' point, right? When he was talking about how, where do all these fights come from? Where do all these wars come from? Where does all this anger and mass, where does all of this come from? It comes from the fact that you doubt. You don't come to the Father and confidently ask for him to provide for you. Doubting and wrath will go together because the reason, the thing is, is if you don't believe that when you come to the Father that he's going to be giving you what you ask for, then you automatically feel like God is just playing games with you right? You, you know, you're Calvinist, right? You know God is sovereign. He can do everything. He created ex nihilo. He could do whatever he wants in this creation. And here I am asking him to do this one piddly little thing, and he's not going to do it. Are, who wouldn't get ticked? If, if, that, if that's where you are, if you say he's a loving father who cares for his children, he can do whatever he wants, but he's not going to do this. That doubting is going to turn you into an angry person. You're going to be convinced that God is just toying with you, that he is just playing with you, and that doubting brings about wrath. It makes you an angry person. When we don't bring our request to God, we find ourselves then consumed with lust, slaves to doubt, and given over to anger. Is that you? Are you consumed with desires? Do you have all sorts of things that rage that you want desperately on the inside, but you're not ready to bring them to God? Are you plagued with doubts? You know, I have a hard time believing that God actually has good promises for you. Are you ruled by outbursts of wrath? Are you regularly convinced that God is just toying with you and you find yourself angry with your lot in life? The problem is that you prefer impotent fantasies, right? Those sorts of daydreams where you squish it out the side instead of bringing it up in prayer. You prefer impotent fantasies and doubt-ridden nail-biting, right? Those sorts of prayers that aren't really prayers, prayers where you've pulled your desires back and not actually given yourself to them before the Father. You prefer impotent fantasies and doubt-ridden nail-biting disguised as prayer, overconfident prayer to the sovereign and all-powerful God. You think that God is playing games with you, but you are playing games with him, okay? You're playing games with God, and that's where this sensation comes from. James' second reason for why we are frustrated in our desires is that when we pray, we ask amiss that we might spend it on our pleasures, okay? So there's, first of all, there's a problem of us not bringing our, our request to the Lord. And then the second problem is that when we do want something, when we do have a desire before the Lord, when we bring it to him, um, we do it all wrong. We ask amiss that we might spend on our pleasures. Either we don't take our wants to God, and then when we do take them to God, we want all the wrong things. Put simply, our problem is that we don't know how to lust in a godly way. Okay? We don't, for us, lusting is only sinful, but we don't know how to have a powerful desire that our heart desperately wants. We don't know how to do that in a godly way. Um, now, as I said before, those promise passages that God wants to give you your requests, those verses have qualifications. It's true, God is not our vending machine in the sky. Okay? God is not our vending machine in the sky. We don't, we don't get to just pull, um, you know, put in a coin and say, God, now I want um, a Dr. Pepper right here, right now. He's, he's not our manservant like that, okay? He's not there to be our vending machine in the sky. God is not our genie in a bottle there to, to grant our every wish. But we cannot escape from the fact that these verses teach us that God will give us what we want, okay? God's not our vending machine in the sky, and yet these, these verses promise us that God is going to give us what we want. How can we make these claims about God then without churning him into this genie in the bottle, this manservant um, in the sky? Look at 1 John 5, uh, verses 14 and 15. 
John says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whenever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Okay, listen, listen to that very carefully. First of all, he says, if we ask anything according to his will, if we ask it according to his will, so there's a, there is a condition there, right? What we ask has to be according to God's will. It has to be according to the sovereign God's will. We don't get to change his mind for him. Um, so he's not the genie in the bottle. Nevertheless, John is commanding us to pray with a confidence. Now, this is the confidence that we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. There's a confidence that this promise is supposed to inspire in us. Um, whatever we ask, he says, we know that he hears us. Whatever we ask, he is going to hear us, and he's going to grant that desire. He's going to give it to us. How do we put those two together then? How do we say, he is, he's not the genie in the bottle, he's not there uh, for me to dictate everything that he's going to do, and yet, and, and my requests have to be according to his desire, and yet, at the same time, he is going to um, answer my requests. Too often, we take this promise and we read it like a hyper-Calvinist. Okay? We, we read it like a hyper-Calvinist. We say, okay, God has his will in the sky. Here it is. Here's his will in the sky. I'm going to make my requests. Every now and then they might match up with his will. And when he does, looks like he's answered my prayer. When he doesn't, it looks like my prayer was not according to his will. Okay? If that is the relationship between our prayer and God's answers to us, then what's the point of prayer? Right? What, what, what is going on in prayer? Because would it have happened any differently had I not prayed? Would it have played out any differently had, had I not pray, prayed? No, it, it'd be the same. What, what is the point of then bringing your request to the Father in prayer? That's sort of a, a hyper-Calvinist way of making prayer completely um, irrelevant. And of course we know, and, and, and um, at the same time, we know that God is not, um, he's not steered by us. We don't get to steer where he goes. We know he's going where he's going, where his sovereign plan has um, dictated. But we don't want to read this passage like a, a hyper-Calvinist. It reminds me of the, was the boy who um, could be invisible, but only when nobody is looking, right? If you, if you all close your eyes for just a second, I can be invisible. You know, I really can, um, and if I, it turns out I'm not, it's because somebody was peeking. Okay? God answers all of your prayers, but only those prayers that are in completely in line with his perfect will. Well, um, John says he's given you this promise so that you can have confidence, so that you could come to him in confidence. That way of reading this passage does not inspire confidence. That way of reading this passage does not make me want to go and knock on his door in the middle of the night again and again saying, please, please, please. Right? But Jesus wants me to pray that way, so there must be something wrong with the way that we're reading that passage. Just as this verse does not teach that God is bound to fulfill whatever sinful desire I might have, so too this verse does not teach that God's will is going to unfold with complete disregard for my desires. Okay? He, it's, it's not teaching that I can make God do whatever I want, even the sinful things, but it's also not teaching that God does whatever he wants without regard for our desires, without regard for our will, our want. God is sovereign and not our genie in a bottle, and he will give us what we desire, okay? So um, it's two, two things that seem like they, they, it's hard to figure out how those can go together. But the problem is, is they're both there in Scripture clearly, so deal with it, okay? That, that's, that's, way it's, that's the way it's presented to us in Scripture. So we have to deal with that. If those seem like things you can't hold at the same time, that's, that's your problem. It's not the text problem. It's not God's problem. Now, but, but let's, let's think about this for a moment because I think we can make a, a bit of sense of it. If God promises that he will give us what, he, what we want, we need to remember that there are two variables here. Okay? God says, I'm going to give you what you want. There's two variables here. There's the fulfillment of the desire, okay? God answering that request, and then there's the desire itself. And we rarely stop to actually consider our wants themselves. Um, we, our wants, because they come out of our own heart, they're so very, very hard to see. But we, what we don't see is how fleeting and how passing and how mutable our own desires are. We can see it in others. I can see it with my kids. You know, my son can come to me and say, I just, I have to have um, a stormtrooper or I'll die. 
I have to have that. And if I don't have it in the next week, I'm just going to fall apart. I want it so badly. And I can just sit and laugh because I know in a week that he won't even remember that. That desire will be completely gone. But for him, it's all, it's the air he breathes. It's all pervasive and he can't see out of it. And we are the same with our own desires. We don't see that our desires themselves are passing things. They're things that are being shaped and formed and changed all the time. So the fulfillment, there's the fulfillment of the desire, and then there's uh, the desire itself. And we don't realize when we come to God in prayer, not only do we bring this thing that we want before him, not only is he negotiating this request, that, this thing that we have requested, we don't realize that we have actually brought our desire before God. When we get down on our knees and we pray to God, our desire itself is offered up before God. Now, sometimes people, um, I've heard people describing, you know, just talking in terms of spiritual warfare, and they're talking about the different, you know, elements of spiritual warfare. And, and prayer is always described like it's artillery, right? Artillery is that thing that you, you do where you can strike the enemy troops without bringing your own troops within range. It's the way you soften up the enemy before you bring your, your infantry in range. And so prayer <coughs> is thought of as this thing that you can do where you can strike the, the enemy at a distance without bringing yourself into danger. But that's all messed up. <laughs> that's not how it is at all. Because when you pray, you take your desire and you take your desire and you take it up before the sovereign God. <laughs> You're not safe when you pray. Your desires, most of all, are not safe when you pray, at least safe in the, in the sense that we think, it's neat, tidy, nobody's going to mess up our hair. Um, when we pray, our desires themselves are offered up before the Father. Not only is the thing requested on the line, but our desires themselves become um, a part of the equation. They are now on the line also. And God does not just answer our prayers. Um, and that's not the only thing he has to do to make these verses work. He could fulfill your desire by giving you the thing you desire. He can also fulfill your desire by changing your desire, <laughs> by growing up your heart, by maturing your will, by making you uh, want in a more godly way. And that's what you, when you bring your desire before him in prayer, you bring up your desire for him to shape. Um, in Philippians 2.13, it says, God, um, it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. God, when you pray, God is not working just on the request, he's working on your will. He's working on how you want, how you perceive the world. God is teaching us then patiently, mercifully, graciously how to want, how to lust for him. Okay? When we pray, we give him the opportunity to teach us how to lust rightly. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. There is when we pray, we're stepping before the Father to delight in him and to want in front of him. And as we're delighting in him, we're going to discover that our wants themselves begin to change. Our wants themselves begin to shift. And he can give you the desires of your heart. This doesn't happen in a moment. This doesn't happen in one single prayer. You don't just sit down and pray and then everything is all the way fixed. But this does happen over a lifetime as he slowly works on your will. And that's why you have to come to that door at midnight again and again and again and again. Because after a while, suddenly you realize, you walk away saying, he's answered my prayer. And you don't realize what actually happened was each time you ask, your thing you asked for changed slightly until he brought your heart all the way in line with his will and sent you out with your want, your desire completely fulfilled, him glorified, and you um, grown up into maturity. Jesus is... Um, a perfect example for us. Um, in Luke chapter 22, when Jesus uh, is, is um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, at that moment in the Garden when he prays and he says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Okay? If it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not, your, not my will, but yours be done. What a complex thing to say. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, that's really tricky to just make sure that you walk through that without messing up your doctrine of the Trinity. But what a clear and simple example of the way we ought to pray. Here is Jesus pouring out his heart. He's not, this is the thing he most wants. 
okay? I don't want to do this. And yet, at the same time that he says that he doesn't want this, he says, but I'm ready to submit to your will. Your will be done. And by the time the whole thing was over with, Jesus could say, and yes, that was a perfect satisfaction. That was a perfect answer of my desire. I've been given what I want. Even though in one sense he was asking for something different, God brought him through that because of the open-handedness of the prayer. He's able to come to the Father. He doesn't shy away. He doesn't say, man, I don't want this, and so I don't want to talk to God about it because he might say I have to do it, and I don't want to do that, so I'm just going to sit at home and play World of Warcraft. Okay? He doesn't do that. He doesn't try to get out of it. He knows what he has to do, and he goes to the Father to talk to him about it, but he does it with an open hand ready for God to shape his will, to shape his desire. He actually took his request to the Father. He said, if it is your will, and he let go of it. He set it in the Father's hands and said to the Father, this is now yours to deal with as you please. So there's two things then. There are two things in a godly prayer. There are two things in godly wanting. And the first is an ability to really say what you want. And, and, and no fear, complete courage, complete confidence that this is something that needs to be brought to the Father. Do you want it? Is it in your head? Is it in your heart? Is it something you desire? Pray about it. Take it to the Father. Tell him what you want. And then at the same time that you pour all of yourself into this desire, open your hand and say, and now your will be done. Okay? Not my will. Your will be done with this. Now that's hard. Okay? That's not easy to do because those are two, in many ways, very opposite things. It's hard to, um, I mean, this is, this is what is so this is what the lacrosse player who won't step into the championship game, this is what he's having a trouble, hard time doing. It's that um, I want this so badly and I'm gonna put all of my desire into it and I'm gonna step out onto this field where in just one um, you know, whistle from the, from the referee and it'll all be gone and I could get none of it. All of my hopes could be dashed and I could be the guy who's on the field balling after this. I'm gonna put everything into this and I'm gonna let it be taken from me. But that's what a godly prayer looks like. That's what it looks like to lust in the godly way. The temptation is to fudge on one of those two, to either not put your desire into it, okay, to just give God one of those, you know, the, the prayer, the, you know, the prayer right before you go to sleep where you say, God bless the world, bless me, everybody in China become Christian, amen. And, and you, you fall asleep. You've not, you, that has nothing to do with what you actually want. Okay, you just know that's a pious thing to say before you go to sleep. All right? When you pray, you put your will, you put your desire, you put the things that you want, and you put them before the Father. Really say what you want, and don't be embarrassed, don't be ashamed of the things that you want, unless you should be ashamed, in which case, be ashamed. But, but put, put your desire before the Father. Really let him know what you think. And then at the same time, you know, we're tempted to um, not be open-handed, to not, to not be ready to have God do with it what he will. We want to read it, um, we, we want to treat God as, as the, as the hyper-Calvinist uh, might. Um, so when you pray like this, then you're climbing up on the altar and you're saying, do what you want, because you're, you're spreading yourself out. You're saying, here's everything I want, and I know you might take it all away, okay? You're climbing up on the altar and you're saying, have at me. But you have to remember, you, you climb up on the altar and it's entirely likely he's going to kill you. It's true. You're going to climb up on the altar and you're going to be sacrificed. But you're going to be sacrificed in Christ, right? Galatians 2.20, he's sacrificed with Christ. He goes down and he's ra risen up again in Christ. When you're sacrificed in Christ, what dies comes back and it comes back remade. It comes back new and he gives you a new life and he gives you new desires. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And some of those things are your desires. Some of those things are your wants. Some of your, the things, your prayer requests are going to be changed as you die with Christ and are risen and you are raised again with him. In prayer then, God fixes our desires. Do you want something? Is there something you want? Is there something you desire? Pray about it. Prayer is just wanting before God, wanting in Jesus' name. So think about the things you want and bring them to the Father in prayer. Now, as you do that, remember we had different qual you know, classifications of things that we don't bring to the Father. And one of them are sinful things. Okay, If you 
if you make this policy with yourself where you say, if I want it, I'm bringing it to the Father, okay? Well, let's say it's just straight up lustful. Let's say it's just straight up wicked. Bring it to the Father. Take it to the Father. And when you talk to him, it's going to have to turn into a confession. It has to turn into the confession. You want something? Take it to the Father. If it's wicked, take it to him to confess it. But tell him, this is what I want. This is the thing I want. Now help me deal with it. Help me be done with this. Con bring it to him to confess it. Um, he's your Father. He wants to hear from you. He wants to hear about this. I, this is one of the things I want to cultivate with my kids is this, look, what's the thing that you're struggling with? What's the thing that you don't want to want? Come talk to me because I want to help you with that. Well, um, if I can do that a little bit, our Heavenly Father can do that so much more. If it's something you want, you better talk to the Father about it. Then all of those wants that we don't know about, the ones that we suspect might be wrong, but nevertheless can't help but wanting in our weakness, or the ones that are perfectly lawful, uh, but we don't know if they're God's will or not, or the ones that we desperately want, but we, are no, we know are preposterous to think that we are ever going to actually get. All of these desires must be brought to the Father. You must bring them to the Father. Otherwise, you, you push them out, squish them out as these silly private little fantasies. Bring them to the Father. You must. You can't hide them from Him. And then you lay it out before Him and you say, here's where my heart is. These are the things I want. These are the things I desire. Now, not my will, but your will be done. Okay? I lay it all out there and then I say, now have at me. All right? You change me. Then do it again. And then do it again and again and again, all night long, keep knocking on the door, knowing that the Father, and doing it with confidence, knowing that the Father is working on you. And some of the things, he's changing your desire so that he can give you something here, and he's going to change your desire to give you something here. And some things you might have wanted the right thing to begin with, and he's going to give you that as well. But what he's going to do is he's going to fulfill your desires. He's going to give you what you want. And don't cringe and don't pull back. Let him do with you what he will. But always come saying, not my will, your will be done. And as you do this, you find your desires um, changed, uh, shaped, transformed. And soon you'll find that the will of the Father has become your will. Okay, that's what we're praying in the Lord's Prayer, right? That your will would be done on, on earth as it is in heaven. And slowly but surely, God brings it about so that the will of the Father is your will. Not just that you have to submit um, to the, that you've just learned to submit to the desires of the Father's will. Not just that you've just sort of relented and said, God has his sovereign secret will, it's going to happen no matter what, so oh well, who, should res who would resist him? Um, but that he actually has brought you up into maturity so that the things that you want are the things that he's going to be doing. Your wills, your requests are in line with his desire. He's grown you up so that you're, um, he's grown up your wanting. He's healed your diseased lusting such that your most heartfelt desires are the desires of the sovereign God. And in this blessed position, your every desire is granted to you. All right? And then we can sit there and say, look, he's going to give you, just want whatever you want, and he's going to fulfill it. Ask it in Jesus' name, and he's going to give it to you. And that's not um, a, some sort of vending machine in the sky kind of God that you're serving. Again, the, the passage from Psalms, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Uh, this is not a name it and claim it theology. Nevertheless, this is God actually promising to give you the things that you truly want. This is not perfected in this life, but it is perfectly begun. And we have a promise that it will be brought to perfect completion. Now, when we, um, many years ago, I wasn't a part of the ministry when um, the magazine Credenda Agenda was started, but that title of the magazine, Credenda Agenda, is a, kind of a little Latin pun. Um, and that's just, uh, Credenda means um, the things that should be believed, and then Agenda means the things that should be done. So it's a nice little pairing. This is a magazine about the things that should be, be believed and the things that should be done. And then as we started planning for this conference, one of the, the title that grabbed us, well, what is, what is the grace agenda, right? What, if, we have, if we believe in grace, what would grace have us do? What is, um, but God's agenda, his grace agenda, um, God's agenda in the gospel and by God's grace has become and is becoming our agenda. 
God is shaping us so that we want what he wants. And here is God's great mercy, his glorious grace. He is slowly making his agenda into ours, his desires into ours. He is teaching us to lust rightly. He's bringing us to that moment where we are actually free of that divided self, and we're free of that moment where we're scared of our own desires because our desires are his desires. And this is the agenda of grace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do ask uh, that we would, and we ask again and again, that we would see your will, your kingdom here on earth, um, that we would have our will be your will, and that we would be advancing your kingdom here. We thank you for the mercy that you've shown us in your son. And in your son's name we pray, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was Ben Merkel's talk from our audio collection titled The Grace Agenda. Go get those talks and many more at canonpress.com.